Hey guys, Joe here from 9to5ers and I wanna do a quick video on understanding banks, at least from a high level. I had a person reach out to me recently and they were going through their first loan and they were kind of bouncing around in a, in a dark hallway and they didn't even have a flashlight to work with. So that kind of prompted me to create this video. I've been dealing with banks for about a decade and a half now and I, I understand the good, the bad, and the ugly of it. And uh, this is a great overview of a bank and just understanding how they view the world and how um, just how the process basically works. And, and I would say this is, a, this is a pretty good video if you are new to banks or you just wanna to get to another level of, of using, having them as a tool in your tool chest, so to speak. Just a quick disclosure here, guys, please read through this uh, if you want to and, and just uh, pause the video if you have to, but we're just gonna move on to the next slide here really quickly. So the overview of what we're gonna be talking about today. You know, why do I need to understand how a bank works? Like, who cares? And what are, what's the, what, are, what is the bank's goals versus my goals and how do they see the world? Because under, helping, understanding how a bank kind of sees the world does help uh, you kind of see what their motives are and what their goals are. We're gonna talk about the different, uh, three different basic types of banks and, and the pros and cons of each. And what are the key roles within the bank, like the, the basic players that you're kind of going to have to be dealing with for the most part, and just some takeaways that you can apply out there in the real live world. So banks, why should I care? What's the point of watching this video? Well, banks are a tool and the tool is only as good as, good as the skill level of the person using it. So they have loans they have saving they have savings accounts checking accounts and they're super convenient especially when it comes to you know paying your bills online and they're time tested so there's a lot of people out there just like well i just pay my bills or whatever through money orders or i have an app and that's that's fine but there are definitely some cons to doing that banks have been around for better or for worse and they are in the business of efficiency and getting you to work with them, but also just making everything as convenient as possible. And they are regulated by the federal government. And I would say personally that there's less of a chance of them walking off with your money versus a brand new app that's come out that's not even really in this country. And who knows what's gonna happen a week from now with that app. So take that for what it's worth, but that's kind of like my personal opinion about it. And what's great about banks is that your money goes to help pay for someone's job, like their, their local job, the teller, the bank manager, the loan officer, the whoever that works at the bank, that you, you are funding a business that is local versus maybe uh, an app that's paying someone in another country or another state. You're seeing your money recycle within the, your local area. And that also goes for the investments too. So if you have, Banks are allowed to lend based off, lend out to, to, to other people through housing, through mortgages, through personal loans, through business ventures, based on how much money they have on hand. And that money on hand is your deposits, your checking account, your savings accounts, which is great. And banks can get you on the path to your dreams a lot faster. Now, obviously it's great if you can pay for everything cash and, and not have to get a loan, but a lot of times that's tough to do. Your dream house, starting a business or growing a college fund for a child is something that isn't necessarily easy to do unless you just already have a bunch of money. Then you, you know, you're not gonna need banks for the most part. But it, it gets you on your path to your, your dream life on a, on a much faster scale, as long as you use them properly. So how do banks view the world how do they kind of look at it they're the others they're on the other side of the table how do they see us how do they see the world well checking accounts savings accounts and cd accounts or whatever types of accounts that they want you to put money into that is their ammunition they want to have a lot of ammunition but not too much and and what i'm saying is is that the banks will give you an interest rate of let's say a half a percent on a CD or a checking account, whatever, 
and then they will in turn your lend your money out to someone else for a car loan or a mortgage or a personal loan at say 6% and they live off of what's called the spread. So the spread would be if they're giving you a half a percent and then they're charging someone 6%, they would be living off of the difference of those two numbers, which would be five and a half percent. That's where they make their money. And that might not seem like a lot of money uh, to, to run an entire organization with multiple salaries and utilities and all the stuff that comes along with owning a owning and operating a bank. But with amortization tables, you can kind of, and, and, and the scalability of what they can use the money at, they, they, can, they can run a profitable business that way. And how do they see loans, like them, the other side of the coin, them lending out that money? Well, they see it as a calculated risk. And they, each bank or each credit union has a million different screening criteria, and they're all unique for the most part. Uh, some of them are kind of standard, but some of them are, are, you know, other points of it are unique. And it boils down to these, these basic uh, points that I'm going to go through here really quickly. And does this potential borrower meet our criteria? And that's, that's a yes or a no. There is a gray area in there a little bit sometimes, but it, it is, you could have your credit score couldn't make or break you uh, in this or how much money you're trying to borrow versus how much you make could make or break you. Is this person going to pay, pay back the loan? Are they going to pay it back on time and in full? You know, obviously they don't want to make loans out to people that just can't pay it back. And, and that could be that that person never had the intent of paying it back or that person maybe had the best of intentions of paying it back, but they just don't understand finances that well. And they, uh, they were trying to buy a house that's worth that, that costs way more than what that, what they earn on an, on an average monthly basis. They couldn't afford the payments. And is the asset worth loaning on? And, and I would say they're not going to loan you $10,000 on a car that's worth $4,000, or they're not going to lend you $200,000 on a house that's worth 150. They're going to lend you $80,000 on a house that's worth $100,000 because they want to have that cushion. You're going to have to bring a down payment to the table so that the so that it makes sense for them. They have you have some skin in the game. You they have some cushion for risk there. And is this an easy loan or a complicated one? Uh, that a lot of times depend, depends on the borrower walking through the door. And I'll tell you this, the banks will never admit to this, but they want to see Jack and Jill borrower come in that both have W-2s. They both have 800 credit scores. They both have an established credit history. They both are, have higher educations. They both have W-2 jobs. They, they've both been in their uh, respective fields for five plus years. They have well-funded 401ks. They have a ton of money in the bank. They have a ton of money in savings. They have a bunch of stuff that's paid off, like a paid off car, a paid off boat, and they have other assets, so to speak. And they just want this house and they want this $100,000 house and they're willing to put down 20% and they make way more money than what the payment's going to be on it. They, you know, make four or five times that. That's, that's their ideal client. And... Most of us don't fit in that category. You know, some of us might be like, listen, I'm going through a divorce. So I got my credits kind of a wreck and I got child support payments that are supposed to be coming in, but they're not set up yet. And I have this old loan, this old medical bill that I'm trying to get um, that's gone into collections. I'm trying to fix that. Or I just switched jobs because I'm moving and I've only been at my job for two months. Those are more, for lack of a better term, complicated borrowers because they just have way more stuff going on in their lives and there's a lot more screening process to come in. Now, that's not the, that doesn't mean the borrower is a bad person. It just means they have a complicated situation and it's harder for them to answer those first two questions. Does this potential borrower meet our criteria and is this person going to pay us back? The first group of people the answer is yes, it's super simple to figure out. 
The second person is a lot tougher. And at the end of the day, they're always trying to answer this one question. Will this business decision grow my business or shrink my business? Because that's what the banks are in business to do, is to grow their business, to keep their employees paid, to, to keep everything moving properly and expanding versus contracting. So bank types, we're going to go through these. We're going to kind of explain them. We're going to talk about the pros and cons at a, at a high level for these. So your national banks are your Chase Bank, your Bank of America. They're in every single state for the most part. There's multiple branches all over the place. And they're big. And they're fee efficient because they've streamlined their closing process. And everybody is pretty quick at closing. And uh, just because the whole process has been streamlined down to the down to the letter they are the the ford or the gm of of banking and the fact that they have the assembly line process everything moves very very quick and efficiently and they are they are flexible but they're only flexible inside the box and, and i use that term in the fact that they're looking for that they need the jack and jill home uh, borrower uh, the, the home buyer versus the second person. They need that. They are the least flexible out of all three of these different types for the most part. And I personally think that national banks are very impersonal. You're, yeah, you might know the teller at your local branch or you might know the, the branch manager, but you don't really know them too well uh, when you get on the phone and you call them. It's going to be a 1-800 number that's going to go to a calling service because everything is streamlined and you're going to be talking to a different person each time. But the banks are everywhere. And if you're someone that is in a transitional state of life, which would mean that let's say you're in college or you're about to move out of a house and move to a different state or whatever, uh, the, the great thing about these banks is that all you have to really change with them is just your ad address. Like if you go to one of these big national banks and you're just like, Hey, uh, I don't live in Texas anymore. I live in Maine. And they're just going to be like, okay. Do, 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 and then like four types and then everything's been transferred over and it's super easy. So there is that if you're a transient type person, uh, like you're not going to stay in the same place for five plus years, 10 plus years, then maybe a national bank might be the way to do it, just for the simplicity of changing things over. Regional banks, regional banks, uh, this is kind of a flexible term in the fact that they might be regional within a state. So they might be pretty prevalent within a state or they might be pretty prevalent within a few states. The main thing is, is that they have a lot of branches around your area. You could type in a Google search of this bank and, you know, within a 20 mile radius, you're going to have multiple, um, multiple branches pop up and their fees are comparable with the, with the national banks and they are hybrid flexibility. So they can play within the box of looking for that Jack and like, obviously everybody wants the Jack and Jill borrower. That's just, that's what everybody's looking for because they're super simple, but because they are regional um, and they are, they need to maybe, they, they need to get, they need to work harder for their clients. They might be able to play outside the box a little bit. They might have someone there that can make a judgment call on your loan. Like, yeah, I know that we got 10 different criteria here and this person doesn't fit two of them, but they got the other eight. Let's just go ahead and pull the trigger on this. A national bank is just like, you either fit the box or you don't. Um, and if you don't have all 10 of those uh, criteria, then, then you're out, then you don't get it. A regional bank is, there's a little bit more personable judgment that happens within that. Someone gets paid to make a judgment call and they got to sign on the dotted line, but whatever. And they're everywhere within your area too. I, I like the regional banks uh, personally. Uh, I, I don't deal with national banks that, that much at all. Local banks, local banks and local and local credit unions. Now, a bank and a credit union are different, but for this uh, 
for this right here, we're going to say that that local banks and local credit unions are are the same. They are not the same um, in a detail oriented fashion, but for for this illustration, we're we're talking that they, that they are the same. So they're micro. So a micro would mean that they have they might have just one one office and that's it. They might have three or four, um, but they have very few locations. And if you do all of your banking with them and you decide to move to Idaho, then you might have to just completely close out everything and then reset your online bill pay with another bank at, in Idaho. And it's gonna be it's gonna be complicated, at least it's gonna be a pain in the neck relocating with the bank. Um, you might have to do that, you might not, but I'm just saying that it's it's not gonna be as simple as dealing with a, a national bank and their fees and their rules vary widely and they are they can they were that this is the place to go if you are a complicated borrower or you're in a unique situation like you're trying to buy something unique and um you are trying to you're you're kind of in a weird situation so to speak let's say you're trying to buy like a you're trying to refinance a farm off of a land contract from someone and you know you have to count the the livestock as assets like or the equipment as assets as as part of the value of the of the property and this is going to be something the national bank is just going to be like, I don't, you're not even speaking my language. Like just go away. They're just going to tell you to go away. <laughs> but a local bank or a local credit union will work with you. And when I say that their fees are and when rules vary, they really do vary um, because their client pool is so small. One bad client could change their rules for everybody else. And, or uh, you know, if they get a good string of really, really good clients, they they would they would open up their rules. So their rules and their regulations uh, are going to change dramatically, and and, and um, they are more focused on the person versus the person. Do, do they fit inside this spreadsheet, this box, quote unquote? So I would say um, personally. I like to deal with regional banks and local banks. Um, I don't deal with national banks that much at all. Uh, but that's, I hope that answered your question. You hope you understand a little bit better. So um, the more boring, for lack of a better term, uh, and the more often you move, the higher up you want to go. You kind of want to move north towards the national bank. Uh, but if you're kind of like in your spot, you're staying there for a while, and and you are a a uh, unique person and you have complicated life or complicated investments, then I would go with the regional banks or the local banks. And this is kind of my takeaways from this is have a primary, have a primary bank account with a bank that you find is most favorable to your terms. And then also have a checking account or a savings account with a backup bank that is different than, than the one that you're working with. And ask yourself, what do you really need? And and why? And the reason why I'm saying have a primary and a backup is that you always, if you go into a bank and you want to take out a loan or you want to do business with them, it makes it way easier and way smoother process if you already have an established relationship with them. And that relationship could literally just be a CD at the bank or a checking account at the bank or a, or a savings account at that bank. They already have your information on file. Maybe they've already pulled your credit like four or five years ago when you set it up and they see like, oh, okay, yeah, this person puts in a hundred bucks into their savings account every month. Like, and that's all they've done. It's just been growing. You already have a good track record with them. And now this person wants to grow with them. They see you as like, oh, this is an opportunity for us to get more business from this person. Let's, let's see what we can do to help them. You know, and, and the reason why I say have a primary and have a backup is because sometimes your primary bank just gets stupid and they change their rules and they just go, no, we're not doing that anymore. And you're just like, uh, okay, what changed? Oh, uh, we did. We decided to change it. So then you got to go to the backup. 
And it's annoying, but it's, it's just the way that it is when you're dealing with banks. So my goals versus their goals. This is kind of a, this, this slide here is to help you figure out, um, is this the right bank or the fit for me? So the banks, I mean, is it, are they looking at it? What can I sell this person today versus how can I help this person? How can I help them, this person grow their lives? And man, I tell you what, the national banks are notorious for what can I sell this person? I've literally sat down with a loan officer and you can tell this person makes money off of selling you products, services, and, and all this other junk. And just by the way that they talk to you, like, oh, you need to do this. Oh, you should go out and buy a new car. Like, and I'm just like, what? Why? Like, why should I do that? And they and they make it sound so exciting. Like, oh, you deserve a new car. Oh, you deserve to go on a vacation. Oh, you deserve this. Well, maybe I deserve those things. Maybe I don't. But I don't want to pay for them. I don't want to live in servitude to the bank for the rest of my life. Versus, how can we help you? What are your goals, Mr. Borrower? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to save up for a college fund for your child? Are you trying to buy your, your dream home? Are you trying to get your starter home, your first home? How can we help you? And that's the mentality of profits first versus client first. And we'll talk about that later. Frisbee loans versus strict standards. And there is a an in-between here. So a Frisbee loan is basically if you can catch a frisbee you get the loan and if you can't catch the frisbee we're still gonna we're gonna throw it again and see if you can catch it again so basically anybody gets a loan and strict standards so these are the two yins and yangs of the, of the extreme of the uh spectrum frisbee loans means that you might catch a loan that you necessarily weren't going to get and they were just in the mood to just, they had too many deposits on hand and they're just like, we need to start loaning some money out. So let's just lower our standards and then whatever. These banks are gonna be all over the map with their lending and they might lend to you today, they might not lend you tomorrow. Uh, and, and they're just, just prepare for um, them to be all over the map with their lending. Strict standards, you're gonna get, this is the other end of the spectrum where it's just like, it's always this. You always have to have 25% down. And you always have to have this, this, and this, no matter what. These are our standards. These banks are super duper stable. They are, um, they're going to change their rules very rarely. And you know what you're going to get when you walk into this bank. And I'm not saying that either one of these, each, each side of this has pros and cons. Uh, the strict standards one is going to be really annoying if you are like just slightly outside of their standards. They're like, nope, we can't do it. Nope, sorry, you don't, you don't do that. You, you don't fit in this box, and that's that can be annoying. When you're almost there, you're almost qualifying, but they just don't do it. But the other side of it is, is like, yes, okay, we, I know what I'm going to get when I walk into this bank, and their their rules and regulations aren't going to change very much. You know. You can almost know for a fact whether you're going to get an approval or not before you walk in the bank versus the Frisbee loan bank, which is going to be all over the map. Impersonal versus personal. This is just kind of like, do you want to have a personal relationship with your bank? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. It, and, and, and that's kind of just a, that's a personal thing. And the larger banks are going to be very impersonal just because they are massive and they're dealing with massive amounts of clients versus that local credit union that they know your first and last name by heart. They go to their kids, go to the same school that your kids go to. They shop the same stores that you do. They, you could sit there and have a 30 minute conversation with this person and they know you. And that could be the difference between you getting through the gray area and getting a loan versus not getting a loan. You know, an impersonal is just going to be like, what's your name? What's your social security number? What's your date of birth? What's your passcode? It's just going to be like you're calling an automated system. It, it can be annoying. Convenient versus inconvenient. Um, this, this a lot of times just ends up with a lot of times the bigger banks can be more convenient just because they have a lot more apps and services and automation and they have that scalability um, versus 
maybe a credit union, a really super tiny credit union might not even have online bill pay. When, if you're trying to figure out which way you should go with this, don't, you don't have to go with the one that has all these different bells and whistles. It's just what bells and whistles do I really need to have for my banking experience to be convenient or not. And features and lack of. Uh, this is a little bit different from conveniences. Different banks will have different types of loans and different and different options for you to pick from. And this this doesn't really go based off of uh, a, a national bank or a regional bank or a, a local bank. It, it just it could vary from place to place, literally. And it just you need to pick the bank that has the level of features that you require, and that's basically it. So the key players at the bank, there's different ones here and they all have different roles and they all have different responsibilities. Try to look at a, try to look at a bank as a mini government. And the fact that each person has their own motives and their own levels of power. And then there's also gonna be a counterpoint to that power somewhere else. So let's look at the first person. This is gonna be, if you're going for a loan, you're going to talk to the, the loan officer first. They are the front end person. This is the person that is usually going to try to fight for you because they want to get that sale. Their pay is their part of their pay is based off of how many loans that they close and they're going to be your main point of contact. So establishing a good relationship with this person is a good idea. And if they work with you, work with them and try to send them more business, let people know. Oh, did, uh, Jamal down at the, our local bank, he is awesome. He closed me so fast and I, he was always on his game. He was always focused. He was always getting things done and solving problems before I even realized that they were problems. You need to go talk to Jamal down at ABC Bank. He's the best. Send them business. Your branch manager. Um, they have more power than the loan officer. And they, they are the, they are the, I would say can be the gatekeeper. And sometimes at a smaller bank, the loan officer is the branch manager. Uh, they have a dual role and they're going to fight for you obviously too. And um, they have more power in the fact that they can make a judgment call or they can get you an answer versus I got to go talk to somebody about that. But they're also a frontline person at the smaller banks and you want to develop a good relationship with them. So an underwriter is, I would say a back end person. You don't see this person, you don't talk to this person directly and they are the checks and balances side of the loan officer and branch manager. Their signature equals their job. Uh, and the fact that the loan officer takes your information and they're like, man, this candidate's great. They're a rock star. They're going to pay back this loan. They're the best ever. The underwriter verifies that they go through all of your information and you don't get to talk to them directly. You have to talk through the loan officer. So that's why having a good communication standard and a good relationship with the loan officer is important because if they are trying to fight for you, they will fight on your side to get a loan. And I'm not saying that they're fighting for you in the fact that they're just trying to get a sale and you're, you should be getting a loan that you have no business getting. I'm saying that sometimes underwriters are just trying to find a way to say no. They just don't want to approve anybody. They're just, for whatever reason, they're just morons. Um, but I'm, uh, that's, that's just some of the underwriters. The underwriter, their job is on the line if the, if, if the loan goes bad. They're the ones that say, yes, this person is a good person to loan to. And if you, the borrower, don't pay, they're going to come back to the underwriter and they're going to be like, you approved this person. Why'd you approve this person? And then they're going to have to justify it. So um, they're the ones that kind of get the, they're doing the vetting. They're vetting you. They're, they're doing their due diligence. Is this person who they really are? D does all of their information line up? Do they fit inside of our box? Can we work with them? And the processor, <clears throat> they are, they're the person that kind of does the grunt work 
for the underwriter, the branch manager, and and the loan officer. It's uh, they are processing paperwork with, um, and just kind of making sure that everything is getting done properly, and and all the ducks are in a row. And they don't really, from from what I understand, they don't have. There's no point for them to rush. They aren't incentivized to rush. They are incentivized to go slow and be methodical. And when the system is working properly, then they are, they're fine. Uh, they're they're going to do what they're going to do, and you're not even going to know this person exists. But if they get bogged down or they're not very good at their jobs or whatever, it's always like, who are we waiting on? Who, are, who is this person that we're waiting on? Generally, the processor kind of works with the underwriter uh, in, in, in getting stuff done. But if you call up your closing uh, your, your title company that's closing you and where you're going to sign all of your documents at that third party there. And they're just like, yeah, we talked to this person in this apartment and, and they're waiting on something, but, and every, nobody really seems to know who's supposed to do what. A lot of times the processor is not doing their job or they're not communicating what needs to be done effectively. And that's when you need to get on your branch manager or your loan officer and be like, what, what are we waiting on? Like what, what specifically needs done? And a lot of times it doesn't have anything to do with you. It just, you need to just crack the whip, so to speak, and tell people, hey, are we closing this loan or am I moving on to another bank? Because you guys are dragging your feet and you're not communicating. So it's good to understand the key players because a lot of times the loan officer gets the, the brunt of everything because they're, they're the only point of contact for a lot of people. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're the, they're the issue. And just knowing how to communicate and understand the different roles of different people uh, does, does help the process move forward more efficiently. So some takeaways here. Understand the difference between the banks saves time and headache uh, and, and which bank to set up with. You know, are you going to be moving soon? Are you not going to be moving soon? What are the bank's priorities? And, and bank's priorities, national, regional, local, they can be client-focused or they can be profit-focused. And the customer being number one is going to make for a better, more stable relationship over the long run. Bank personnel, you know, each role has a different objective. And you just need to understand that they have different responsibilities and motives. And you just kind of have to go with the flow. But you got to keep on, you got to keep up with people. You got to keep contacting the person. Like, hey, what's going on with this? Hey, follow up, follow up, follow up. So guys, what'd you think of this? Did we answer all your questions? As always, what stopped you in the past from reaching your financial goals? Let us know down in the comments. What struggles have you had dealt with the banks? How can we help with that? What types of videos would you like to see next? Please like, comment, subscribe. We really appreciate it. And if you're on Facebook, check us out at 9 to Fivers. Thank you guys so much. We're here to make you smarter today and richer tomorrow. Have a good one.